Welcome to White Coat Investor, podcast number 76, Good Debt and Bad Debt. Splash Financial is a leader in student loan refinancing for doctors, offering fixed rates as low as 3.25% APR. Hundreds of you check your rate with Splash each month, and it only takes minutes to do so. They're one of the few companies that offers a great resident and fellow product as well, offering low rates and deferred payments for up to 84 months. They also don't charge any application or origination fees and have no prepayment penalties, meaning you maintain your payment flexibility. Splash's new lower rates can save doctors tens of thousands of dollars over the life of their loans. Go to whitecoatinvestor.com slash Splash Financial today to get your rate in minutes. I actually have a blog post coming up soon on Splash, so I'd love to get an email from you about your experience if you've applied to refinance with Splash. I'd like to know, you know what rates you were offered, what terms you were offered, what you liked about the experience, what you didn't like about it, whether you were looking at the resident program or the attending program, etc. So if you've done that recently or if you do that after uh, hearing this on the podcast, please send me an email and let me know what your experience was like. Our quote of the day today comes from Albert Bartlett who said the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Thanks for what you do. I know you're likely on your way into work or maybe on your way home from work after a hard, long day. And I just want to be the first to thank you because I know chances are very good that nobody else said thank you to you today. And I appreciate what you're doing. It's hard. It's difficult. It took a long time to do. I know you're paid pretty well to do it, um, but it cost you a lot of money to get in that position to be paid. So thanks for what you're doing. All right. Uh, Thanks to those of us, those of you rather, who are leaving us questions at speakpipe.com slash white coat investor. We will use those recorded questions on future podcasts. So if you'd like to hear your voice on the white coat investor podcast, here's your chance. Uh, I've got a question uh, to answer from Dusty on Twitter. He actually gave me two questions. The first one I think is a little tongue in cheek. He said, should I use this ATM? And he included a picture of a Bitcoin ATM. And uh, I guess if you've got Bitcoins, you should use that ATM to get your Bitcoins out because who knows what Bitcoin's going to do from here going forward. I think his more serious question was, as a soon-to-be attending, working with residents, what is the best way to get them thinking about financial topics without overwhelming them? I'm already planning on buying the White Coat Investor book for all residents I work with. Well, I think the book's a great way. Um, The nice thing about the book is they have to show at least a little bit of interest. So you're not preaching to an uninterested crowd. If they're not interested, they just won't read the book. And chances are good it'll just sit on their shelf for a little bit until they finally realize they need it. Then they'll pull it off and read it and maybe thank you for it a year later. Um, So I think that's a great way to do it. Just give them a book. I think dropping little pearls is helpful as well, Um, particularly when they realize that you're different from some of their other attendings in the way you're managing money. And that will give you a lot of opportunities to maybe explain why. I've found also that these conversations tend to happen after midnight a lot more than before midnight. I think we're all a little bit more open. Maybe our defenses are down a little bit that we're willing to talk about uh, more serious stuff like that after midnight. Um, Not sure exactly why that is, but that's something I've always found to be true in the emergency department. Uh, If you want to really get to know the nurses in the emergency department, wait till after midnight and you wouldn't believe what they're talking about. Next question comes from the Facebook group. This is uh, Bruce on the Facebook group who said, what do you think of CPAs, CFAs, CFPs, CHFCs, and other financial certifications and designations for those looking to hire someone with these qualifications? Do you trust any of them? If so, which do you recommend? Also, would you encourage anyone looking to learn more about finance and portfolio management to perhaps get one of these designations under their belts? Well, first of all, Bruce has listed off all the designations that I think actually do matter. Um, I think those designations are the highest ones in their fields, and they're quite uh, impressive and respectable designations. Now, none of them take as long to get as an MD or a DDS or a JD or anything like that, other than perhaps the CPA. Um, But they all at least show a commitment to the field uh, for an advisor who says, I'm going to be here for the long term. This is what I'm doing with my life. I'm somebody you can trust. And I have at least this basic level of knowledge and had to pass a test to get there. With the CPA designation, a certified public accountant, I'd like to see them have the personal financial specialist designation as well. So a CPA slash PFS. A PFS is basically uh, a CFP, the Certified Financial Professional, in addition to their CPA. Um, The CFP is probably the mainstay in the financial planning field. More people that are actually want your business probably actually have this designation. It's the most well-known one. If you 
go to forums and, and ask how long people studied and worked to pass that test, they'll tell you about uh, 200 hours. So granted, 200 hours doesn't seem much when you're putting in 80 hours a week as a resident, um, but 200 hours is far more than the vast majority of the alphabet soup of designations out there. Uh, CFPs are also required to have uh, three years of work experience, which I think, um, granted, it can be in, in sales. It doesn't necessarily have to be in really given true advice, um, but at least it represents something. CHFC is similar to a CFP as well. There's a little more coursework. There may not be a test for that one. I can't quite remember. I'd have to look it up, but it's a similar designation. Typically, the people that get CHFCs, however, come from the insurance industry. Um, so it's not uncommon to see an insurance person uh, that has a, uh, a CHFC designation along with their CLU uh, designation, uh, which is more insurance focused. Now, you have to be a little bit careful, I think, when you're hiring someone that comes from the insurance side to give you financial advice, just because I think there's a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of bias there to maybe sell you insurance products that you don't really need. So you have to be a little bit careful there. Um, but the designation is about the equivalent of a CFP. The most difficult one to get of these is a CFA, a Chartered Financial Analyst. And the reason why is that it takes uh, three difficult tests, and these are tests that everybody doesn't pass. You know, I can't remember what the pass rates are, but I want to I want to say something around 70%. There's three different levels of them. You can't take them right after another. I think you have to wait uh, six months between them or 12 months between them, something like that. And um, and they're actually you know require quite a bit of studying for each of those levels. So uh, if your advisor has a CFP and a CFA, uh, they actually put in some work and um, are clearly going to, to be in this field for the long run. Unfortunately, most of those with the CFA are managing money. You know, they're working and running a mutual fund, they're running a private equity firm, those sorts of things. And so most of the financial planners you run into aren't going to have a CFA. Next question is from James on the Facebook group. He said, going beyond the 4% rule, I want your opinion of different drawdown strategies in retirement, given that the sequence of returns matters so much. What asset allocation do you recommend in the beginning of retirement? What about the strategy of going very conservative uh, at the beginning of retirement to avoid the potential to lose half your money in the first years of retirement and then shifting to a more aggressive allocation as you age? That's a great question. Okay, The 4% rule is not a rule in any way, shape, or form. It's a useful number that tells you about how much you need to retire. And the idea behind that is that you can take out about 4% of your portfolio each year, adjust it up for inflation each year, and expect to not run out of money over 30 years. It's not really designed to be the exact method anybody uses to spend their money in retirement. And I don't know a single person who follows the 4% rule uh, like it's you know dogma. Um, but it's a good guideline. That's about the ballpark you ought to be in. The point of the study that came out with the 4% rule was that it's not the 8% rule. You just can't take out that much money. Even if your portfolio averages 8% a year, you can't take out 8% a year because of sequence of returns risk. And what that is, is that's the possibility that despite having 8% average returns, you get the crappy returns first and the good returns later. And if that happens and you're withdrawing money from the portfolio, you're going to run out of money, even if you're only taking out the average return. And so you got to be a little bit careful with that. So there's dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of different drawdown strategies, how you should spend your money, how much you can take out each year. I think the best guideline is the one advocated by Taylor Larimore. He's the 94-year-old Battle of Bastogne veteran and considered to be you know, the king of the Bogleheads over at bogleheads.org. And basically what he does is he adjusts as he goes. Every year he takes a look at his uh, portfolio, how much is in there, and if it's been a bad year, he spends a little bit less. If it's been a good year, he spends a little bit more, gives away a little bit more. And I think that's a great strategy to follow. You know, just be flexible. And the more flexibility you incorporate into your system by minimizing your fixed expenses, uh, the better off you're going to be and the more options you're going to have in retirement. And so that's the strategy I advocate is just adjusting as you go. So what asset allocation do you recommend in the beginning of retirement? Well, here's the deal. I don't really recommend a specific asset allocation for anyone at any time. So I can't really answer that question much. But the idea he's getting at here is should you have a less aggressive asset allocation around the time of retirement? And the answer is probably yes. And the reason why is that helps minimize the sequence of returns risk. 
So we're talking about the last five years before you retire and maybe the first five years in retirement. That's the time when you should be the least aggressive in your investing. And uh, with the idea that if you actually increase your stock allocation throughout retirement, rather than decreasing it as you age, it may actually decrease the chance of you running out of money. And so there's some pretty good data that suggests that's been true in the past. We don't know if it's going to be true going forward, but it's a reasonable way to manage your money in retirement. Uh, he talks about the potential of losing half your money in the first years of retirement. Boy, if you've got, if you're going to lose half your money in just a few years of retirement, you're investing way too aggressively. Um, I mean, if you're hundred percent stocks and you just retired uh, and you have a nasty, nasty bear market like 2008, yeah, you could lose half of your money. So I think you probably ought to be something besides 100% risk, you know, risk on all the time as you go into retirement. Um, otherwise, you are risking losing half your money. Next question is from the Facebook group as well. This comes from Doug who says, how does one still enjoy traveling or vacations when in that early attending phase when trying to live like a resident? Any advice or percent of income living expenses that is reasonable to spend on those activities? Well, none of us want to be a monk, right? Here's the deal, though. When I say live like a resident, I'm talking about living like the rest of America, right? The average household income is something like $60,000 a year. That's what a resident makes. So you can go do what the average American is doing. You can go on a trip. You can go on a vacation. You can have some fun. You can buy some stuff, okay? Uh, I'm not telling you to go live a Mr. Money Mustache lifestyle where you're spending $24,000 a year, okay? Go ahead. Go spend $60,000 a year. Heck, you give yourself a little bit of raise from residency. Give yourself a 25% raise. Give yourself a 50% raise. Spend $90,000 a year. Even so, you're going to have plenty to carve out and use to build wealth, to pay off your student loans, to save up a down payment for your dream house, to catch up to your college roommates with their retirement savings. There's going to be plenty there. What you can't do, though, is have a lifestyle explosion as you come out of residency. You can't go straight to spending two hundred dollars or $250,000 a year. And that usually starts with a big fat doctor house and a couple of cars bought on credit. That's what you can't do. So can you still enjoy traveling or vacations? Absolutely. Go on a vacation. Go travel some. But this isn't the time in your life to take that $20,000 vacation to Fiji. You can be able to do that later. But this isn't the time. You're living like a resident. Okay, so maybe if you got lots of miles and you really shop around, maybe you can do a trip to Iceland. If you stay in an Airbnb when you go there and you watch where you eat out, you know, maybe you can go down and, and spend some time at the lake. Maybe you can go on a camping trip. You can drive across the country and, and stay with family. You know, those are the kinds of things that, of course, you can do. Um, but you can't take, you know, a $20,000 international vacation with your family of eight every quarter in those first few years out of residency. You're supposed to be living like a resident. And so I'm not going to give you a specific percentage of income, but the idea is that you are saving enough to pay off your student loans within five years of finishing residency, that you are able to save up a down payment on your house, and that you're able to max out your retirement accounts. If you're doing all that and you have some left over, feel free to go spend it on a vacation. All right, next question. Uh, this is actually three questions from one uh, listener that came in by email. Um, let's just go through them one by one. The first one is, as a recently graduated resident, after listening to your podcast on advice for new attendings, I wanted to share something I did that I think could benefit some of your listeners. All right, so here's a tip from a listener. Moonlighting usually picks up in the senior year residency. Making $1,000 or more a shift is great extra money. After signing your new contract for your job, I have found that many do not allow you to contribute to the employer 401k until six months into their new job. Sometimes that can be 12 or even 18 months too. If your job starts in July, you'll probably miss out on contributions for that year. What I did was from January of my senior residency year until I started my new job, I maxed out my 401k for the previous year aggressively using the funds from my moonlighting job to solely fund this. I feel that in the first year as an attending as much pre-tax money you can stash away if financially able is a decent alternative to use this extra money. All right, a couple of caveats I think I'd give on that recommendation. First of all, you can't put the moonlighting money into the residency 401k or 403b. You can live on the moonlighting money and defer your income from residency into the 403b or 401k. Uh, yes, money's fungible, and so it's basically the same thing, but just bear in mind that that's what's actually happening. 
Secondly, even in that last year of residency and that first year of attending hood, I think that's the time to be using Roth accounts if at all possible. Yes, tax deferral is always nice, but save that for your peak earnings years. And the year you leave residency, and especially the years in residency, are not your peak earnings years. Use the Roth accounts if you're able to. If there's a Roth 403b or a Roth 401k, use those. Do your personal uh, Roth IRA, do a spousal Roth IRA if you're able to. Um, but yes, I think that's a great way to realize a way to get more money into retirement accounts. If you only have a tax deferred 401k and you want to do this, fine, use the tax deferred 401k. But as soon as you walk out of residency, convert it to a Roth IRA. Same thing. Okay, second question was, I was curious what the term good debt means. I've heard anecdotally that it could be to carry some form of debt for your credit score. Can you expand on this? Is buying things on a credit card and then paying it off each month? This is what I do in accumulating good debt credit. I've been told through family and friends, once I pay off my student loans completely, my credit score will get worse and that I should specifically keep a balance on some of my credit cards so that my credit score stays optimal for when I go to apply for a mortgage loan, et cetera. I feel this is kind of silly holding credit card debt at 18%, so I don't do it, but wanted your opinion if I should be listening to this advice. I don't know what my credit score is. I'm confident it's over 800, but I don't know. I haven't checked. And frankly, I don't care. The reason why is I don't plan on borrowing money ever again. Not in any meaningful way anyway. And so I think people who are living their lives to, to maximize their credit score or tracking their credit score on a weekly or monthly basis or worshiping at the altar of the credit score uh, are making a serious mistake. Okay, The numbers that matter in your life are things like your savings rate, your rate of return on your portfolio, your income, your net worth. Uh, those are the numbers that matter. The numbers that don't matter are your credit score. Once you have a score over about 740 to 760 anyway, you're, got, uh, you're gonna get as good of a mortgage loan as you can possibly get. So there's no benefit to getting you know, a, a score of 843. It just isn't gonna do you any good. So at a certain point, you don't have to pay any more attention to it. And the truth is that most docs have enough debt that just making the required payments is gonna give them a score over 740 to 760. A credit score basically is a score of whether or not you pay back your debt, whether you say you're going to, whether you do what you say you're going to do. And if you do that, your credit score will be adequate to great, get a great mortgage. People want to lend you money. They're going to do all they can to lend you money. And so unless you're skipping payments or, you know, doing all kinds of things wrong, your credit score is going to be fine to get a mortgage. You don't need to do anything special about that. But he brings up this term good debt. And good debt is not usually applied to this idea of using a credit card or much less carrying a credit card balance. It's usually applied to this idea that some debts are better than others. I don't deny that's true. Some debts are better than others. The terms are better. Maybe they're tax deductible. Maybe the interest rate is lower. Um, you know, some debts are better than others. But I don't draw a hard and fast line between good debts and bad debts. And the reason why is they all cost money. When you borrow money, it costs money. And so this traditional idea that the good debts were mortgage debts or debts on investment properties or student loans and the bad debts were debts on boats and cars and credit cards and pets and whatever else you want to borrow money for. Um, and yes, I suppose it's, it's better to borrow money on something that's going to appreciate or something that's going to give you a higher income or something that you absolutely need to get to work, that kind of a thing. Um, but the truth of the matter is all debt kind of works the same. And so unless you have a better use for your money than paying down that debt, pay off the debt. Um, and if nothing else, it gives you a little bit of a psychological reprieve. It lifts a burden off your shoulders and gives you the ability to take risks in your life and in your career that you might not otherwise take. So even low interest rate debt, one, two, three percent, I'm amazed when people pay that off just how much happier they are. And so I would consider, even if you have low interest rate debt and uh, you know some other things that you could do with that money, that you consider prioritizing that debt, get it out of your life, and I'll bet you don't go back into debt after you pay it off. It just seems silly sometimes to do that. Now that said, if you aren't maxing out your retirement accounts and you got a 2% student loan, I would probably max out my retirement accounts before paying off that 2% loan with extra payments. Um, you know, Is that good debt? Well, it's pretty good debt, 2% you know, stretched out over, over a pretty good time period. Um, but I'm not sure I, I really like to get into the terms good debt and bad debt. 
Third question, for taxable retirement accounts, I've, had you, I've heard you refer to target retirement Vanguard mutual funds as tax inefficient funds. Is there any poster information you can send me to so I can learn more about this? I wanted to keep my portfolio as simple as possible so the target funds seem to be a broad and easy way to do this. Most of my accounts are largely made up of this fund, both in taxable and non-taxable accounts. But if I can learn how and why in a taxable account this is not a good idea, I'll look to switch my taxable account portfolio to maybe just the individual stock components of the target retirement fund. Okay, here's the problem with target retirement funds. I think they're fine. They're a great place to start. If you only have one type of retirement account and that's available in there, sure, use it. The problem with it is most docs, at least by mid-career, have six or seven different accounts they're investing in. Maybe an old 401k, their current 401k, a couple of Roth IRAs, a taxable account. And that fund may not be available in all the accounts. So if you've got to set up an asset allocation in one account, you might as well do it in all your accounts because you ought to be looking at all the accounts that are designated for one goal as one big account, and your asset allocation ought to be spread across those accounts. The issue with the target retirement fund in a taxable account is that it contains taxable bonds. And for a typical high-income professional like a doctor, you don't want to hold taxable bonds in a taxable account. You want to hold tax-exempt bonds or municipal bonds. And so they don't have target retirement funds for high income professionals. They don't have them uh, for taxable accounts. And so by definition, when you buy that in a taxable account, you've got bonds that are less efficient than what you probably want in your portfolio. And so it's probably not a great idea to have that in your taxable account. Um, you know, if you're willing to give up a little bit of return for simplicity, you can do that. But I think it's probably a bad idea for most. Next question. I was told by my employer that if I moonlight, I will have to give the check to them first. They will process the check and pay me after tax. So I will not get a 1099, but still a W-2. In that case, can I claim any tax deduction for CME, medical license, etc. that you had suggested when moonlighting as a contractor? Well, that's a wacky employment agreement. First thing I'd do is go back and read my contract to make sure it actually says I have to do that. And I'd be very hesitant to sign a contract that required that. And the problem here is you're losing the benefit of getting that 1099 money. It's basically being converted into W-2 money. So now you have no self-employment income. You can't use that to open up an individual 401k. You're not going to be filing a Schedule C where you can deduct all kinds of expenses like uh, your medical license and your CME costs and your scrubs and that sort of stuff. And so it's not, um, you know, it's not ideal for sure. But if that's the agreement you signed with your employer and you're not ready to quit that job, then you may be stuck doing that. Um, kind of sucks, though, I think, for an employer to put an employee in that position. I suspect there may be some government agencies or universities maybe that have contracts like that. I feel sorry for you guys that have them, though. Um, by the way, those tax deductions for CME and medical license and that sort of stuff, if you've got a W-2 job and a 1099 job, technically you have to split that deduction. If 90% of your income is coming from the W-2 job and only 10% from the 1099 job, and you're using that CME for both jobs, technically you only get to take 10% of it as a deduction on Schedule C. I don't think that's what most people are doing, but that's the way the law is written. Next question. I've been looking into refinancing periodically over the past year mostly just to check on rates and see what they would do during the year after reading your blog about fixed versus variable rates. And I have a question for you. What would you consider to be the minimum difference between rates of fixed and variable refinance options to justify picking a variable rate over a fixed rate? Or is there even one in your opinion? For example, in my case, I have $165,000 in loans. I'll be making $250,000 a year. I'm going to try to live like a resident and pay off my loans in three to five years. However, many of the fixed and variable rates that I've been quoted only differ by a range of 0.5 to 0.9%. With the goal of paying off loans quickly, I'm comfortable with the idea that a variable loan rate could increase because I might still come out ahead in the end if it does not do so too rapidly. However, my question is whether you would deem the gap between these fixed and variable rates, 4.07 and 3.15 respectively, too small to justify picking the variable rate i.e. is there a minimum difference between a fixed and variable rate you would want or even expect to see to feel okay about the rate potentially increasing? This is a good question. Um, I think uh, if you're not getting much of a difference, it's not worth it. You might as well just take the fixed rate. But bear in mind, when you get a fixed rate loan, you're buying two things. You're buying a variable rate loan and you're basically buying an insurance policy. You're paying the lender to run the interest rate risk for you. 
And there's a cost for that insurance, just like any other insurance. So if you can afford not to run that risk, or you can afford to run that risk yourself, then I would do so. The idea behind taking a variable rate loan over a fixed rate loan is that you can afford the maximum payment that would come out of it, uh, number one. And number two, that this rate would have to increase early in the payback period and increase rapidly. For example, in this case, this doc uh, could take the 3.15% variable loan. If rates went up by half a percent, the doc's still ahead because the fixed rate was 4.07. In fact, even if the rates went up 1% or more, as long as they didn't do it in the first year or two of this three to five year loan, the doc's still gonna come out ahead. And so it's not some terrible sin to take a variable rate loan as long as you can afford it and as long as um, you know, you're willing to run that risk yourself. And in retrospect, I think I would have taken a lot more variable interest rate loans. Uh, as interest rates have fallen over the last, you know, decade or two, uh, that's actually been the winning thing to do uh, for that entire time period. We're now in a time period where it seems more likely that, that the rate increases we've seen in the last year or two are probably going to continue for the next year or two. Uh, and so I would expect rates to rise a little bit, but it looks like the Fed's been raising them about 0.25% every six months or so. And at that rate, if you're going to pay off your loans in three years, yes, I, I would take a uh, you know 1% lower rate that's variable and run that risk myself. So what can I give you for a guideline? I think over 1% on a loan that you're going to pay off in less than five years is probably worth taking a variable rate. Less than 0.25%, I would just take the fixed rate. Uh, anything in between, I think it, it depends on how comfortable you are running that risk yourself. All right, next question. I'm trying to decide on a one-time close construction to permanent loan for remodel addition project we are taking. Uh, there's a 30-year fixed at 4.5% uh, with some points I pay, a uh, 4.625% one, a 4.75% one that's no cost, a 10-1 arm, another 10-1 arm. I've read some of your articles, Haley and Variable Interest Rate Loans, but that seemed more geared towards student loans with a quick two to five year payoff. Do you have any advice for me with this on the mortgage side? It seems to me the rates have nowhere to go but up over time. So perhaps the peace of mind with 30 year fixed is the way to go. Well, rates can certainly go lower. I mean, they've been on an uptrend for the last two years and they could easily go back to where they were two years ago. Um, I think uh, the 10 year treasury has gone up something like 1.7% over the last two years. And so rates certainly can go down. That said, if I was taking out a 30 year mortgage, I'm not sure I would take a variable interest rate loan. That's a long time to run interest rate risk. And so I'd probably lean more toward a fixed loan if I thought I was really going to have it for 30 years. Um, but it turns out this doc is just doing this for a remodel. Um, when you're looking at a 30-year loan for a remodel, you've got to wonder if maybe you're spending too much. I mean, if it's going to take you 30 years to pay off a renovation, that's a, that's a heck of a renovation. And it's interesting, as I, as I got more information from this doc, it looks like the half a point that the doc was thinking about paying to get a lower interest rate was $10,000. If you do the math, he's talking about a $2 million addition or renovation, which is obviously a massive project most of my listeners can't afford, uh, even if they do so on credit. And so the first thing I did was make sure this doc had enough income to justify it. And as you might expect, it's a doc in a high cost of living area. That's why the housing is so expensive. Um, and it's a doc that was making three quarters of a million dollars. So this doc very well might be able to afford it, even though it's, it's a stretch even for him. Um, so I think the first thing to do, though, when you're looking at something that big is to, is to give serious consideration to paying with cash as much as you can. You know, save it up and uh, do it a piece at a time, maybe not do as big of a renovation. Um, we're looking at doing a major renovation, and that's what we intend to do. We're going to, you know, delay it if we don't have the money to do it and pay cash as we go along. Um, so paying for a renovation over 30 years just seems kind of insane to me. But, you know, if it makes sense to you and this is what you're going to do with your life, then I guess it's okay to do. Um, but I'd certainly try to, just like a mortgage, try to pay it off in 15 years at least. Um, however, uh, his real question was about the variable versus fixed rates over, 
you know, 30 years, 15 to 30 years rather than two to five years. And I agree, there's a lot of time there for something bad to happen. And so I'd be much more inclined to pay a little more to get a fixed rate than a variable rate if I was going to borrow money for that long. Um, but truthfully, first thing I'd do is try to figure out a way not to owe money for that long in my life. Um, you know, I really don't like owing people money. Even our 15-year mortgage, it was at a very good rate. We paid off in about seven years. So uh, I'd be a little cautious with that. All right, this episode was sponsored by Splash. Splash Financial is a leader in student loan refinancing for doctors, offering fixed rates as low as 3.25% APR. Hundreds of you check your rate with Splash each month, and it only takes minutes to do so. They're one of the few companies that offers a great resident and fellow product as well, offering low rates and deferred payments for up to 84 months. They also don't charge any application or origination fees and have no prepayment penalties, meaning you maintain your payment flexibility. Splash's new lower rates can save doctors tens of thousands of dollars over the life of their loans. Go to whitecoatinvestor.com slash Splash Financial today to get your rate in minutes. Be sure to subscribe to the White Coat Investor monthly newspaper. It comes with the free 12 email financial boot camp series to get you up to speed with the other listeners and readers. Head up, shoulders back. You've got this. We can help. See you on the next podcast.